Good evening. I am so excited to be here this evening. My name is Allison Kaplan. I am Director of Education at the National First Ladies Library located at the National First Ladies Historic Site in Canton, Ohio. And before we get, get started with tonight's program, which I'm super excited about, um, I want to mention some upcoming programs. So the best way to access programs after the fact is either to go to the National First Ladies Library Facebook page where we live stream or our YouTube page. And we are currently in kind of the final hour of getting ready for an exhibition. So we have been a little lagging in getting our YouTube um, up and updated. But I do want to mention we had a really great curator series chat last week with an educator from Lincoln's College. We are Lincoln's Cottage. We talked about Mary Lincoln and grief, and we're going to have that one up shortly. Um, that has been really great, and I highly recommend it. And I want to mention some upcoming programs too. So um, we are going to have a legacy lecture soon. We've had a little vacation from our legacy and we're really excited to get them up and running again because we have lots of cool um, programs around upcoming exhibitions. And on May 4th, we will be hosting a Q&A with jewelry designer Anne Hand. Um, she has an amazing history in Washington, D.C. Um, she started her time there as the wife of the chief of protocol for Lyndon B. Johnson, and she developed um, into a jewelry designer um, and created jewelry for many a first lady, um, many powerful women in Washington. So we're really excited about that. Um, it should be really great. Anne will be with us on May 4th at noon. And again, if you can't make it, sign up. We will get you a link to a recording after the fact. Um, we are opening an exhibition at the National First Ladies Historic Site with our NPS partners. And that will open, I believe it's May 4th. And it celebrates the centennial of Nancy Reagan. We are super excited about it. We are hosting some really amazing loaned items from the Reagan Library and Foundation, as well as the Reagan Ranch. Um, and that will open, we believe, May 4th. Um, so we're currently getting ready for that, and it's been really exciting. Um, along with that, we have a number of programs in the works. The one that I want to mention to you is our next book club on May 23rd at 6 p.m. Um, we're going to be discussing Karen Tumulty's The Triumph of Nancy Reagan. It is a really interesting book. It's worth reading. Um, you can access it through your local library, your local independent bookstore. Um, it is also available as an audio book if you like to do that. Um, and I think it should be a really, really great discussion of all things um, Nancy Reagan, um, 1980s. I think there's so much to discuss around her. Um, and I really enjoyed the book. So I hope that you will um, join us for that. And let's see, what else can I tell you about? Well, tonight we're going to discuss Betty Ford, which I am super excited with about, because if you tune in, you always hear me sing the praises of Betty Ford. Um, but there's one other Betty Ford related program. We are doing a film discussion of the television series, um, television drama from the 1980s, The Betty Ford Story. That is going to be on May 24th at noon. We've moved it, um, if you registered for it prior, um, because we are going to be visited by a historical interpreter that performs as Betty Ford. She's really fantastic. And I'm really excited to discuss 
television depictions of Betty Ford. Um, if you were with us for our last film program, we watched Hyde Park on the Hudson. We talked about Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, we were with Float is Forever, the podcast host. So this time we're going to get a little taste of historical interpretation of Betty Ford. If you register, you will get a film link directly from us to watch the TV movie from the 1980s. And we're going to also be looking at the new Showtime series, um, which has Michelle Pfeiffer um, as Betty Ford. I've really been enjoying it and maybe we'll discuss it tonight in the chat too. So that's a little bit of what is coming up and I am excited about it. I hope you are too. As the program is going, um, I will drop some links so you can find ways to connect with us. Um, and if you have any questions, whether it's a technical issue, you can't hear, um, you're not connecting with it, uh, leave that in the chat. And if you have questions for Sarah, leave them in the chat too. I compile them all. We try to get to as many as possible. And again, this is a program that takes a lot of work on Sarah's end. There's history, there's cooking. Um, we're so lucky to have Sarah and her husband as well behind the scenes, um, coordinating all of this with us. And the recipes are historic. So um, we will look over those recipe cards um, and make sure they are correct and get them out to you if you haven't gotten them. And Sarah can clarify as we go through. Um, so Sarah Morgan is the um, Instagrammer that does cooking with the first ladies. She has a background in um, a bachelor's degree in history and some historic museum experience. And one day she came upon a book at the thrift store, a cookbook um, of first lady recipes and uh, her Instagram account was born. And so we've been so lucky to connect up with her and help her um, and have her help us host these programs. And um, they're kind of like a hybrid romp through pop culture and an introduction to the first lady. So if you know a little bit about the first lady, whether you know a lot about the first lady, whether you were alive during Betty Ford's era, or you just are a big fan of the 70s like me, um, this program has a little of everything. And again, we're cooking from history. So sometimes it's not always going to be the most appealing thing. And sometimes it's going to be something really yummy that you're going to want to try. So we are so thankful to Sarah that um, Sarah can make all the magic happen. We know we don't have the big budget of the Food Network, but we are here to look at um, food and hostessing and first lady roles in history. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah and I'll be here in the chat with you. Thanks so much. Welcome, Sarah. Yay, uh, my mic is good, right? That I hit on mute. I hear you. Okay, good. Okay, well, so hey y'all again, you know, I'm Sarah Morgan and welcome to Cooking with the First Ladies live program for once again, the National First Ladies Library. Now, Betty Ford literally danced to the beat of her own drum and was an enthusiastic, charming, unprecedentedly candid and a first lady who literally never apologized for her opinions and once famously said, quote, they can kick me out, but they can't make me someone I'm not uh, in regards to the role of the first lady. So uh, this evening, uh, as Allison said, you know, I'm going to share a little bit about the 1970s, uh, which one of the things that was known as was the third great awakening. And of course, Betty Ford, just the symbol of not only the culture of the decade, uh, but the political times as well. Um, then I will share how to make some of Betty's original recipes, including her double chocolate chip cookies, corn pudding, her curried tuna casserole, and her blue nana bread. Uh, so finally, uh, I got most of my research, not only, of course, from the National First Ladies Library, but Betty's own book, as well as documentary footage of her as well. Uh, so we're going to start the evening tonight by 
making a Shirley Temple, which was one of the original mocktails. Um, it would kind of be disrespectful to start the evening with an actual cocktail as Betty Ford struggled with alcohol and addiction, as many people do, uh, but she always forthcoming and forthright, overcame that and was so uh, honest about what was going on in her life and made it so much easier for other people to do the same. Uh, so with our classic Shirley Temple, we're gonna just start with our glass of ice, super simple, um, lemon lime soda, a splash of grenadine and um, we are going to garnish with some maraschino cherries. I'm sure everyone has had a nice Shirley Temple before. Um, it's a wonderful cocktail, mocktail, what have you. Um, so that's the original Shirley Temple, but I kind of came up with um, one on my own for Betty Ford specifically. Um, I'm not sure that she would have loved it or anything, but I made a little fancier one, a Betty Ford First Lady mocktail. So we're gonna do a Limonada San Pellegrino to start. Uh, and then instead of grenadine, we're gonna use pomegranate molasses. So just a splash of that. And then we are gonna use Starlino maraschino cherries. They're just a little bit fancier of a cherry um, and just fun and just a way to um, acknowledge Betty Ford and the lady that she has deserved to be. So there we have it, the Betty Ford cock mocktail, I should say, the Betty Ford mocktail. There we go. Okay, so um, my hands are a little sticky. <laughs> um, so now I'm just gonna step over to my computer and share a little bit of a PowerPoint and a little bit of information about the wonderful Betty Ford. All right, so the mid 1970s were not only a time of political uncertainty, but also included amazing strides in pop culture, technology, and fashion. Tom Wolfe would name the 70s as the me decade due to this new attitude of Americans who focus on individualism rather than community, which is very different from the culture of the 1960s. The 1970s were famous for bell bottom jeans, shag carpet, and the rise of disco, but was also an era of economic struggle, cultural shifts, and technological innovations. The late 1970s saw changes in fashions, fads, and trends alongside together with political and environmental awakening, with the first Earth Day celebrated by actually Pat, Pat Nixon in 1970 and some of the newest inventions that began the tech world as we know it today, with developments such as the digital camera, the first mobile, mobile phones, and the first Apple computer. Betty Ford, who was born Betty Ann Bloomer, but she always wanted to be known as Elizabeth, was first lady from 1974 to 1977. And these years saw a wide range of pop culture. People were listening to a variety of music ranging from the Ramones who, re who released the famous Blitzkrieg Bop with the iconic lyrics, hey, ho, let's go in 1976 to disco tunes of the disco era to Diana Ross 
ain't no mountain high enough. Some of the newsworthy events of the late 1970s was the Patty Hearst kidnapping and her potential Stockholm syndrome experience, as well as the Walton experience, which involved an alien abduction and NASA, which launched the Viking program and sent Viking One towards Mars. Several iconic movies were also released, including Jaws, which was a movie Betty Ford herself actually refused to see. Uh, another movie, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Wheel of Fortune and Happy Days debuted on TV, as well as Saturday Night Live. Another popular show was the Mary Tyler Moore Show, which Betty Ford actually guest starred in one episode, making her the first first lady to appear on a TV sitcom. The 1970s were one of the most fashionable decades of all time, and the era birthed an eclectic mix of style influences. The skirts got shorter, boots got taller, floppy hats, bell sleeves, shearling coats, jumpsuits, platform shoes, clogs, and mini skirts were in style. Dubbed the polyester decade, people were also into crochet, patchwork, and embroidery. Jane Birkin and Jean Shrimpton were style icons, and Beverly Johnson became the first African-American Vogue cover model in 1974. Farrah Fawcett was another fashion icon, whose poster in the one-piece bathing suit became the best-selling poster in history. She also introduced the world to the most popular hairstyle of the time for American women known as the Farrah Flip. Betty, always a progress progressive first lady, embodied the style of the era as well with her colorful scarves, high neck Chinese style collared gowns and wore not only her favorite color of green, but relied on earth tones as well, and even wore a mood ring. She also chatted on her CB radio under the handle First Mama. Elizabeth Ann Bloomer was born on April 8, 1918, the third child of William and Hortense in Chicago. Her father was a traveling salesman, and by the age of two, the family had lived in Denver, but finally settled in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is where Betty considered to be her hometown. Sadly, her father passed away from carbon monoxide poisoning while working on their car, and her mother took over financial responsibilities. She influenced Betty's independence as well as her future work for the Equal Rights Amendment because she worked not only as a real estate agent, but was also the president of the Crippled Children Association of Grand Rapids where Betty also volunteered assisting children with disabilities. Other influences of a young Betty was Eleanor Roosevelt, who she saw as being able to express her opinions independently of the president and the fact that she saw her shape the role of first lady with her individualism. She began dance lessons at the age of eight in 1926 at the Cala Travis Dance Studio which she graduated from when she was 17, as well as Central High School. Dance quickly became her focus and passion, which she later described as her, quote, happiness. Due to the Great Depression, she began to teach dance to young children in Grand Rapids during the summers of 1937 and 1938. Uh, Betty also attended the Bennington School of Dance in Vermont and studied under pioneering dance instructor, Martha Graham. The young Betty Bloomer also enjoyed many sports, mostly due to her having two older brothers. She participated in competitive ice hockey and football, which of course were mostly due to being played by men at that time, and also played golf, tennis, and went skiing. In order to pay for her dance classes, Betty worked as a model for a local department store, Purple Schmeyers, where in later years, she returned as an assistant and then head fashion coordinator. She also taught dance lessons, which included the Foxtrot, the Big Apple, and waltzes to students for 50 cents each at her own studio, the Betty Bloomer Dance School. In 1940, she moved to New York City to attend the Martha Graham Dance School and performed in their dance troupe, which included a performance at Carnegie, Carnegie Hall, excuse me, 
Betty continued working as a fashion model while in the Big Apple, appearing in runway shows and modeling in department stores. As first lady, she continued to advocate for the arts and was instrumental in her former teacher, Martha Graham, receiving the award of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Now, after returning to Grand Rapids in 1941, Betty continued to teach dance lessons at the Travis School, where she had started her own instruction, of course, years before. She not only took on students who were hearing and sight impaired, but also offered classes for African-American children and did choreography for local performances. She married William Warren in 1942, and his job took them to Toledo, Ohio, and also Syracuse, New York. But once again, before returning home to Michigan, where Betty worked in a food processing factory. Although she wanted to divorce Warren a few years early, uh, earlier, she stayed with him. And after he suffered a coma due to diabetes, she did work to take care of him, but that further enlightened her on the unfair salaries of women experienced in comparison to men. They eventually divorced in 1947, in which she cited extensive repeated cruelty, making her the third presidential spouse to have a first marriage and in divorce. Now, Betty was introduced to Gerald Ford before her divorce was officially finalized, but as soon as it was, they began dating. Gerald, who went by Jerry, proposed quickly in 1948 after saying there was, quote, something he had to do first, which was to announce his candidacy for Congress. Gerald feared he wouldn't be favorable with conservatives due to his marriage with not only a divorcee, but also a woman with a career in modern dance. Either way, they were married shortly after election day in 1948. Uh, their wedding attire was simple. She wore a dress that cost about $50 while he sported shoes that didn't even match his suit. And in fact, Gerald had to leave their rehearsal dinner early to deliver a campaign, campaign speech and then was late for the wedding because of attending a rally for his supporters. For their honeymoon, they went to a University of Michigan football game followed by a speech by Republican candidate Dewey, and finally attended a campaign rally. What a honeymoon. <laughs> On November 2nd, 1948, Ford was elected to the first of 12 consecutive terms as a U.S. congressman. In 1964, Betty was diagnosed with a pinched nerve, which led her to be prescribed pain medication, also meant to treat developing arthritis, but she eventually would be, become addicted. Due to her time spent alone, especially during her time at the White House, she also developed a problem with alcohol consumption. Following a nervous breakdown in 1965, she began treatment for stress with a psychiatrist. Even so, she wouldn't really admit to problems with alcohol or prescription medication. Uh, Betty and Gerald had four children, Michael, John, Stephen, and Susan. She acted not only as a congressional spouse, as well as mother, but also volunteered with the Cub Scouts, was a Sunday school teacher and member of the PTA. Betty always emphasized her priorities as a wife and mother, but continued to support women who chose not to work and focus on homemaking. Living in Washington, DC, she hosted and acted as tour guide for Gerald's visiting constituents. In 1974, during her time as second lady, Martin Luther King Jr.'s mother was murdered and Betty made it a point to attend her funeral, acting as a representative of the administration. She also advocated for federally funded daycares, advocated for the disabled, and worked with Barbara Bush to help form the Republican Women's Federal Forum, whose goal was to get political wives together to discuss current policies and stay up to date on government issues. Betty was also, of course, just this huge supporter of making the arts available to everyone, which included the Art Train, a traveling group of artists and craftsmen who toured the country by railroad. Uh, Betty Ford became first lady on August 9, 1974 after Spiro Agnew, Nixon's vice president, and then subsequently Nixon himself both resigned following the Watergate scandal. Gerald Ford became the first in office to not be elected as vice president or president. 
Therefore, Betty didn't have to go through a presidential campaign this time or a traditional inauguration. She did, however, hold the Bible during the inauguration ceremony and her background as a dancer just really made it easy for Betty to transition into such a public role. Gerald said, quote, I am indebted to no man, only one woman, my dear wife, Betty, as I begin this very difficult job. Uh, in fact, she was thrust into this role so quickly, they hadn't even cleaned out their garage yet. Uh, in addition, following Nixon's departure from office, Betty clearly stressed her admiration as well as friendship with Pat Nixon. In fact, the Fords walked with the Nixons as they left the White House and was captured and now a famous photo, which is um, what you're seeing right now. Uh, Betty was unprecedentedly straightforward as soon as she became first lady and in 1974 gave a rare press conference which outlined her goals, which included performing arts, the ERA, abortion rights and disabled children, as well as publicly discussed her divorce and the fact that she'd seen a psychiatrist. This was the first time a first lady was so open about not only the issues she was concerned with, but also in disclosing such personal details about her life, which many years later in 1978 actually included communicating her intentions to have a facelift. She was also the first first lady Republican to take a feminist agenda and to differ so much from her husband's views publicly. Again, she was an outspoken, but also hip first lady who was not only active in social policy, but also set a precedent as a politically active spouse of the president, which she says was, quote, sometimes to the detriment of my husband. Uh, now, her candor and ability to speak her mind made her unique and popular with the American people. Her first press conference was held in September of 1974, and she discussed the Equal Rights Amendment, as well as legalized abortion. She, be, uh, she became known as the, quote, Fighting First Lady by Times Magazine, who also awarded her 1975's Woman of the Year because of her representation of American women. Her son, Jack, said Betty used to read through briefing papers, but she never disclosed what was discussed and referred to herself as, quote, a sounding board, and that political pillow talk would happen on occasion. Now, Betty attended the Remember the Ladies exhibit at the National Archives. The opening, of course, was named for the famous former First Lady, Abigail Adams, who was an also outspoken advocate for women during her time and featured women of the Revolutionary War. Betty also attempted to make a connection between a 19th century suffragist, as well as an advocate of temperance and abolition, Amelia Jenks Bloomer, who actually popularized the first pants for women, subsequently known as bloomers, uh, but she was not able to. Uh, Betty's involvement in advocating for the Equal Rights Amendment was one of her main focuses. Now, her speech in October 1975 was one of the most remarkable and notable ever given by a first lady on the issue of gender equality. It was in this speech, she said, quote, being a lady does not require silence. Now, it was Betty's words that helped encourage the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. Actually, during her time as First Lady, she persuaded Gerald Ford to appoint more women to the administration than any previous president, even though she didn't succeed in getting him to nominate a woman to the US Supreme Court. Uh, she was a, just an advocate for allowing women to serve on the Supreme Court, but Betty Ford also contributed to traditional charities, as she promised, such as the Hospital for Sick Children in DC, no Greater Love, which benefited children of the Vietnam War POWs and MIAs, and the National Lupus Foundation. Now, dancing remained a large part of her life and as First Lady especially. Not only was it a regular after-dinner feature, but the Fords participated as well. She uh, also danced at public events, uh, including with Tony Orlando in 1976 at the Republican National Convention. She also wasn't afraid to try popular grooves of the time, including The Bump, 
and the hustle long before Michelle Obama ever attempted to do the Dougie. Uh, on January 19, 1977, Betty Ford took the time to famously jump onto the cabinet room table and strike a dance pose, which was captured by the White House photographer. A friend of the Ford family said Gerald, quote, about fell off his chair when he saw the iconic photo for the first time. Uh, very shortly, though, after becoming First Lady, Betty was diagnosed with breast cancer. And despite her health issues, she powered on and campaigned hard by taping radio ads and also spoke at rallies. She openly discussed her diagnosis, treatment, and discussed what was at the time considered taboo to talk about. She also encouraged women to perform self-breast exams and to schedule annual mammograms stressing the importance of early detection and early treatment, um, but also the fact that that doesn't make you any less feminine. Because of her, thousands of women are alive today due to early detection and her encouragement of breast cancer awareness. After her very public mastectomy, there was a spike in breast cancer diagnosis and treatment, which became known as the Betty Ford Flip. The very direct usage of the words breast cancer led to a discussion of what would become standard worldwide. This was also the first time since Florence Harding back in the 1920s, a first lady allowed her own medical conditions to be released so publicly to the American people. With her collaboration, Newsweek published an article in 1974, which detailed her treatment and afterwards, over 60,000 letters were sent to Betty, in addition to tons of donations to the American Cancer Society. Her public openness forever changed the perspective of the disease. Uh, now, during high school, Betty's daughter, Susan, lived in the White House and served as official White House hostess following her mother's surgery for breast cancer in 1974 and eventually helped her launch National Breast Cancer Awareness Month and has continued to advocate and give speeches about the importance of early detection. Now, Susan had a very unique experience when they held her prom in the White House in 1975, which was the first and only high school dance ever held in the executive mansion. Susan and her fellow students from the Holton Arms School enjoy an evening of dancing, Swedish meatballs, an intergalactic band, and a sunset cruise on the presidential yacht. Susan also had a Siamese cat named Sean who slept in her bed at the White House, in addition to the Ford's family dog, Liberty, who gave birth to her first litter of puppies while living there as well. Breast cancer was not the only subject Betty did not have trouble talking about publicly. On 60 Minutes, she not only openly supported legalized abortions, but also said, quote, she wouldn't be surprised if her 18-year-old daughter was having intercourse. She also admitted that she had smoked marijuana when she was younger. After the interview, Gerald Ford joked that she had only cost him about 20 million votes. But either way, Betty's approval rating skyrocketed. She said, however, I would give my life to have Jerry have my poll numbers. Even so, when it aired on August 10th, 1975, she received a lot of anger from organizations such as the Women's Christian Temperance Union, who for the first time since yet another former First Lady, Frances Cleveland, had been censored, uh, which was in that time due to her low cut gowns. But most, however, supported her and were appreciative of her honesty and willingness to share her opinions, even if they were controversial. Uh, Betty also traveled extensively during her time as First Lady, accompanying the president on 12 international trips, including visiting Romania, Poland, Yugoslavia, and China. After the Vietnam War ended in 1975, thousands of refugees arrived in the United States, which included hundreds of orphan children. Betty and Gerald flew to California and she became the welcoming voice and even almost considered adopting one of the children. Uh, Betty said, quote, on behalf of all American immigrants, as we are all immigrants, and then further ensured them there would be a, quote, promising future ahead of them. 
Now, Betty uh, played a large role in the 1976 campaign and was a symbol of moderate to liberal, liberal Republicanism, which was in direct contrast to that of the emerging conservative wing of the party. Although this helped his campaign by drawing support from fellow moderates in the Republican Party, independents, as well as Democrat, Democrats who were anti-Carter, but also it kind of isolated the conservatives within the Republican Party as well. Uh, instead of the Ford campaign generating publicity around the First Lady, as in past several elections, Betty's came from the American public who clearly were vocal in their admiration. One of the most popular slogans was vote for Betty's husband. There were also slogans such as Betty's husband for president in 76 and even keep Betty in the White House. Uh, after losing to Jimmy Carter, Betty Ford actually gave the concession speech, excuse me, for Gerald because he had lost his voice becoming the only candidate spouse, even to this day, to ever do so. She also continued to be involved in the feminist movement, lobbying again for the ERA, and was on the board for the Betty Ford Center. She was also the first recipient of the National Women's Party's Alice Paul Award, which was named for the legendary suffragist, uh, which she received in 1975. In 1977, Betty, along with Lady Bird Johnson and Rosalind Carter, attended the National Women's Conference in Houston, and in 1978, led a large march in Pennsylvania to encourage ratification for the ERA. In 1982, she spoke at the Lincoln Memorial and led a march in continued efforts. The following year, she was awarded the Susan G. Komen Foundation Award, which was later named after Betty herself. She also joined Pro-Choice America in her continued efforts for supporting legalized and safe abortions. Betty also testified in Congress two times, one of which was unique because it was the only time two first ladies, the other again being Rosalind Carter, spoke on the same issue. After leaving the White House, Betty turned more and more to alcohol and prescription medications. In the spring of 1978, it was evident to more than just her family, but the public during a reading of Peter and the Wolf in the Soviet Union. Susan Ford eventually confronted her with a formal intervention with which, after getting over her anger, registered herself into rehab at Long Beach Naval Hospital's Drug and Alcohol Rehabilitation Program. Betty, as she had with her breast cancer, fully disclosed why she was in rehab and in solidarity, Ger Gerald permanently quit drinking as well. After her experience, she of course decided to start the Betty Ford Center, which was dedicated on October 3rd, 1982, and focused on the needs of women and rehabilitation due to the unique needs women face in these types of recovery. The center also focused on families of those in recovery, which included a children's program of those affected, and Betty was very hands-on and assisted with counseling for patients. She also advocated for changing the public perspective on addiction. She published her first book, Times of My Life in 1978, which detailed all of this, um, as well as her road to recovery. In addition to addiction, she became one of the first Republicans to advocate for AIDS after becoming aware of the issue as some of those in recovery were battling the disease. She would also later speak out in favor of same-sex marriage and workplace rights for the LGBTQ plus community. In 1985, these actions led her to receive the Los Angeles AIDS Project Commitment to Life Award. Betty even wore her AIDS ribbon pin in support to the Republican National Convention in 1992. Uh, Betty received the Congressional Gold Medal in 1998 and the Pre Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1991. Uh, Betty Ford has always been said to have had more impactful and lasting impressions in comparison to her husband, who only served 896 days and was trying the entire time to pick up the pieces of the presidential office after the Nixon scandal. Even Gerald Ford once said, quote, when the final tally is taken, her contribution to our country will be bigger than mine. 
The Fords lived in Rancho Mirage, as well as Beaver Creek, Colorado. In Colorado, Betty became interested in gardening in high altitude alpine climates. And in 1988, the community of Vail dedicated the world's highest botanical garden to her. The Gerald R. Ford Park and the Ford Alpine Gardens are located 8,250 feet above sea level and the Betty Ford Alpine Gardens continue to focus research and provide education as well as feature therapy focused on the medicinal powers of nature. The Fords, who were married for 58 years until Gerald's death in 2006, have been described as being one of the most adoring couples in White House history. They were both equally respectful of one another and had a strong relationship with her husband, not only personally, but politically. Gerald died at the age of 93, and Betty traveled to all of his funerals, from California to D.C. and even to Michigan, even though she was in fragile condition. After his death, Betty continued to live at home and underwent some surgeries in 2006 and 2007. Uh, she was unable to attend Lady Bird Johnson's funeral, and so her daughter Susan stepped in. Uh, she wasn't able to attend the inauguration in 2009, but Susan said, quote, mother said, I don't know if she knows what she's gotten herself into. She's going to be really busy. Uh, Betty Ford sadly died on July 12th, 2011, and her funeral was attended by other first ladies, including Hillary Clinton, Michelle Obama, Nancy Ray Reagan, and Rosalind Carter. Uh, Carter stated in her eulogy how extraordinary Betty was, but also said, quote, it was my privilege to know her. Now, the Fords were notorious for being simple and budget friendly when it came to eating. So we're going to get into the cooking. Uh, but Gerald Ford actually toasted his own English muffins, buttered them himself, and served himself orange juice in the White House kitchen. Betty said, quote, all he needs is a toaster. Popular foods during this time were cheese balls, as well as hamburger helper, Swanson TV dinners, tab soda, and all of those besides the cheese balls balls were introduced in 1974. Uh, Betty was also a unique and original hostess as well, being described as, quote, marvelous and hip, who used American-made items ranging from Native American baskets, antiques, and once used unique candle holders made from wooden spools from a historic textile mill for decor. Her parties and dinners were dynamic and informal, being compared to those hosted by Eleanor Roosevelt. She was also compared to Eleanor due to her cost-effective kitchen. Betty would serve her famous casseroles to even dignitaries um, visiting the White House. Her first was the King of Jordan very shortly after she became first lady. Uh, she once told her staff she forgot to take care of the traditional menu, but to do that, but Soup is less expensive and will cut the cost considerably. Uh, she also suggested using fresh in-season veggies rather than frozen, buying American uh, made goods rather than imported, make small portions and let people take what they want and to always use the leftovers. Even though she was economical when it came to dinners, she would serve meals based on protocols again, for those visiting dignitaries, and continued to apply her own philosophies to save money. Now, one of her most famous events, though, was in 1976 during the bicentennial celebrations when they hosted Queen Elizabeth. Um, okay, so let's get cooking. Okay, um, so I hope everybody got their recipes. Um, and I did see in the chat as well as Allison, there is a couple typos, um, but super slight. Um, so we've made our mocktail, but tonight we're going to start off by making Betty Ford's double chocolate chip cookies. Um, so what you'll do, you'll preheat your oven to 350 degrees, of course, 
and then in your mixer. And I always like to say, I have two mixers going on right now. And when you have two mixers, that means it's serious. <laughs> um, so uh, for our first mixer here, it's going to be a cup of butter softened um, with your sugar. Um, and we're gonna start off by mixing that. Uh, next, we're going to add our brandy and uh, or vanilla, whichever you choose to use. Mine's vanilla uh, and eggs. All right, um, and we're going to continue to mix this, but we're gonna stir in our melted chocolate and sour cream next, which I appreciate Allison saying in the beginning, I am not the Food Network. <laughs> I don't have the resources, but um, my chocolate was a little melty, but it'll be fine once I start to mix it again. And I will, um, if you've ever tuned in any of my programs, I will show you the finished product either way. Um, so. Pop that back on there. We've got our chocolate. Um, and then our next thing is we're going to mix all of our dry ingredients. Um, so uh, that would be your flour, your cocoa, your baking soda, salt, baking powder, um, all of that into your bowl. And we're going to, um, as you always do with cookies or cakes or anything, mix it in just kind of really slowly. Um, so while we do that, um, did you know? that uh, Gerald Ford actually started the whole turkey pardon situation um, that we have today when it's Thanksgiving. Um, now, Betty Ford's double chocolate chip cookies are famous uh, because Susan Ford actually shared this recipe um, to the Gerald Ford Presidential Library, I believe. Um, but also she called these her Thanksgiving cookies because um, she always served them on Thanksgiving. Uh, even though normally, of course, people serve pie or different things, but these were her Thanksgiving Day cookies. Another interesting uh, Gerald Ford fact is uh, Gerald Ford actually posts Humously, for whatever reason, pardoned Robert E. Lee. So, okay, so then our next step is going to be all of our white chocolate chips and our nuts. So I've got two cups of white chocolate chips, um, as well as uh, one cup of almonds. But I'm just gonna kind of fold those in once this is pretty mixed up. So I kind of wanna scrape it down the sides just a little. And these are amazing cookies, honestly. It's been really hard for everyone in my household to abstain from eating those final products over there. Okay, so what you're gonna get is a lovely looking dough. 
and then you're just going to drop your cookies onto a greased baking pan um, and bake that on uh, 350 um, just until they're done. And you'll get a beautiful plate of amazing Betty Ford double chocolate chip cookies, um, which are amazing. They're just great. Um, okay, so next we are going to make Betty Ford's blue Nana bread. Um, I honestly didn't think I could come across a, a better banana bread recipe, um, but this one is absolutely my favorite. But we're gonna start off, um, I've got to uh, peel and mash our bananas, which I meant to do beforehand, but I didn't get a chance. Um, so as Allison was saying, uh, the Showtime series uh, that's come out uh, is amazing. Um, and they did just this past uh, Sunday feature what I was talking about earlier, the uh, King of Jordan's state dinner, uh, which was her very first state dinner. Um, and it was um, just about a week after she became first lady. And, uh, you know, had to have been very difficult for her. And she sort of, as they described it, kind of married Pat Nixon, as well as her own ideas about a state dinner together. So I thought that was interesting. Um, she didn't want to cancel. She didn't want to, she wanted to put her own touch on it. I thought that was very cool. Okay. So we're going to put that in the second mixer. Okay, so in here, I already have my sugar and my butter. Um, and then uh, this will be on a 325 degree pan. Uh, but after we, you know, kind of mix up our butter and our sugar, again, I said I <laughs> melted the butter a little earlier. Um, we're gonna beat in our eggs and vanilla. I'm gonna to continue to mash my bananas, even though they're gonna get mashed anyway in there. Um, so that looks pretty good, but I'm gonna turn that down. I'm gonna put in half of the flour. And half of my banana. Okay, um, so while I'm adding these in, um, now Gerald Ford, um, I'm not sure, if I, I didn't know this before really reading uh, into Betty Ford, um, but did, did y'all know that Gerald Ford had two assassination attempts that he survived? Um, and actually the first was Lynette Squeaky, from uh, the, you know, the Manson cult member. Um, and she uh, attempted that on September 5th, 1975. Um, she wanted to make a statement about people who uh, wouldn't uh, assist with environmental uh, type things or help stop pollution and, and things like that. Um, or acknowledge the effects of that on the air. So, um, and the environment, which is interesting, but also not, of course, the right way at all to go about that. But his uh, second attempt uh, was very shortly after by Sarah Jane Moore. Um, and that was on September 22nd, 1975. Uh, both of these occurred in California. And uh, Sarah Jane Moore 
claimed she wanted to change the country through a violent revolution and believed that would be the way to start it. Um, so after those two attempts, uh, Gerald Ford began wearing a bulletproof trench coat. Okay, so this looks really good. Our dough. For sure, I have some flour in my shoes. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so you have this really cool dough. And then my favorite part about the whole thing of blue nana bread is because you add the blueberries in. You have to fold your two cups of blueberries in. And um, you also want to mix in your allspice and your sugar. So we're just going to. Uh, stir that in just like this. Um, but it is my favorite. And then you will pour it uh, into your greased bread pan. Um, but you will have either to need two bread pans of this size or do it in two, two batches like I do, because I only have the one pan. So there you have it. And we will bake that along with the cookies. But what you will get is the most beautiful loaf of blue Nana bread. And I guess I should bring the cookies back over here too, <laughs> which I normally do. Um, okay, so the last recipe I'm actually going to show how to make, um, I'm going to share the tuna casserole, but it was too difficult um, to kind of show, um, is your corn pudding. I say corn pudding because we're down here in Tennessee. Um, so you are going to take your whole kernel corn right there, add your three tablespoons of flour, and I gotta grab a spoon. Um, get that all together well, and this is a pre-greased Pyrex. You can use different bowls, but um, you know I kind of like to consolidate my dishes, so that's just me. So then take your cream style corn. Okay. Uh, and your uh, sugar and pinch of salt. And the baking powder was also in there. Um, and as some of you noted, uh, the scalded milk was not added. But uh, so we're gonna mix all of this together. Gonna add our butter. Eggs. And your scalded milk. We're gonna mix all this together and we will be ready to go to bake this in a 350 degree oven uh, for about 40, 45 minutes. So I do have several things after this live program um, that I will be baking, but um, I will show you a beautiful finished corn pudding. And um, I don't think anybody's gonna stick around to wait 45 minutes for uh, the corn pudding to bake, but um, it turns out to be a absolutely beautiful corn pudding dish. Um, now I absolutely had to share it. I just um, didn't, I, there's no way that I could figure out how to actually present it, but this is Rosalind Carter's uh, curried tuna casserole. Um, it is absolutely fantastic. It's amazing. I know the recipe was shared with everyone. 
Um, it's beautiful, it's amazing. Um, so definitely try uh, that as well. Um, I definitely wanted to share uh, just because she was such a fan of casseroles. Um, she was also, of course, a fan of soups. Um, so, uh, well, thank y'all so much for joining me uh, this evening and uh, hope y'all, as they said in the 1970s, uh, had a far out, out of sight uh, time and thought these recipes were cool beans. Uh, but also, if you haven't already, check out the new Showtime series, The First Ladies. It's really interesting. Um, and finally, as always, follow the National First Ladies Library on all their socials. Um, and you can follow along with me on my Instagram at Cooking with the First Ladies. So again, thank you all so much uh, for uh, tuning in. And um, I, hope, I hope again you enjoyed it. So Thank you, Sarah. That was wonderful. You are so great at multitasking. I am always impressed to see you manage the PowerPoint and then transition from managing everything in the kitchen. So we have a lot of thank yous. That was really delightful. I, of course, loved seeing the animated PowerPoint. I think you're better than Al Gore a PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> Uh, there were some questions and I'll try to uh, get to a few of them. Someone asked if you would cut the banana bread and show us the inside or show us a slice sure. so we can see it, the texture. 100% that I can do. Um, there was also a question about your very nice little pattern bowls. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, I actually, um, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, is that good? Yeah, I think that's great. We can see it. Um, the night I would, that would have to be a, my, um, I work at my synagogue <laughs> and, uh, my boss, um, actually bought those for me because I do these live programs. Um, I think you can just get them on Amazon because my husband had actually put the same patterned ones in the cart, yeah. but were bigger bowls. So and I'm sorry, but those were a gift solely because they, people know I do this and they are like, here's dishes. <laughs> it's perfect. It's perfect yeah. to have all those little dishes. It felt, it felt very food networky. Um, the other question was, what is the book sitting next to you? Can you tell us about some of the Betty Ford related artifacts? Yeah. This one? Okay. This is, this is great. Um, this isn't really old. Um, some of my things I, when, you know, when I do Jackie, I talk about my ma'am, all different things. I didn't really have anything, but, um, my husband's family lives in Florida and we recently went to visit them and we went to the, um, it's in Claremont. It's mm -hmm. the, it's a presidential museum. I can't think of what it's called. It's silly but it's really fun. Um, it's got a giant replica of the White House. So of course my husband had to take me there. Um, and this just happened to be in the gift shop. So this is Gerald Ford and his family paper dolls. And I think it's hilarious because... <laughs> what do you do with that? Um, and then of course I have Betty here. Um, I didn't get out my first lady's cookbook this time, but um, so that's where I got that. That was just the, I think somebody wanted to know, um, and I, I didn't say, and I don't know off the top of my head, what was the cookbook that you found at the thrift store that sparked this whole experience? Cooking with the, uh, the first lady's cookbook. Got yes. it. That's what it was called. The first lady's cookbook. Yes. And I usually have that where this is, and I didn't get it out today. Oh, so um, it's the president's hall of fame in Claire. The president's hall of fame. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and then there were some more specific questions and again, we'll clarify and update our recipe cards and get them out. Um, but how much scalded milk and butter? Um, it is one cup of scalded milk. And as for the butter, I'm one second. You're fine. <laughs> I had it already together. Hang on. Uh, 
two tablespoons. Uh, two tablespoons melted butter, one cup scalded milk. And then 10 ounces of shell mac, um, macaroni cooked or raw. Should we be cooking it ahead of time? Cooked. Yes. Cooked. Um, yep. looking through, I think everything else. Oh, how, the, there's another, how much butter, how many eggs, how much milk. And again, we'll clarify those with the recipe cards that we'll send out. Um, the Betty Ford information was great. I wondered who is our next first lady that we're going to be enjoying? <laughs> Nancy Reagan. Great. So I'm super excited to see we're going to be popping into the 80s. Do you have any ideas um, of what you're going to be cooking yet? No, not at all. It took me all from doing Ida McKinley back in to this moment to be like right here right now so mm -hmm. um I'm also hoping to be able to give y'all some more you know like I used to some more pre-recorded videos and have a little more time once the summer hits um and whatnot but no I have absolutely no idea um but I know it'll be fun um I think Nancy Reagan is gonna be super awesome. Uh, and I don't know. Now I just can't get over Betty Ford, honestly. I think I she's know. just awesome. I just. So. I'm a big fan too. And so if people are interested in more Betty Ford related info, you can sign up for our film discussion to watch along um, with us Which and discuss the fun. it'll be really fun and we're going to look at the showtime series too um and then i just wanted to endorse as we're moving into the next month our nancy reagan exhibition is going to be up on view nancy reagan was a big fan of the holidays and bringing some hollywood and glitz and glamour to the holidays um and i know she has a really good festive Christmassy um, monkey bread recipe in that um, first lady's uh, Christmas book. So I'll send that your way. Yay. Yay. Well, thank you so much. This is really great. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. And thank it's you guys so great so to meld the cooking and the uh, history of first ladies. And you do such a great job, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks all so much. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Bye. Bye.